Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. You're listening to episode 102 of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton. This episode is part of our Vibrant Music Studio 101 series, and this building block is called Consistent. Hey there, lovely teachers. Welcome back to our Vibrant Music Studio 101 series. This is a set of foundational concept podcasts that can be useful for a teacher at any stage of their teaching journey, whether you're right at the beginning or you need a refresher. And each week I'm giving you a different word, a different adjective or mantra to consider so that you can think about your studio a bit differently, refresh some of your ideas about how you can run your teaching studio and how you teach. This week's building block word is consistent. Would people describe your studio as consistent? Well, let's step back for a moment and let's consider why this is important. We spoke last week in episode 101 about being deliberate and treating your business as a business. And in that episode, I asked you to consider this question every time you're making a decision about your business. What would a business do? Think about a stereotypical business or a great business that you know, a local one, an online one, doesn't matter. What would they do? What would a good business do? And good businesses have policies and procedures. Why do they have those policies and procedures? Well, they have them so that they run their business consistently so that they provide the same exceptional, excellent experience for every one of their customers. Because if you don't have a set of policies and procedures in place, if you haven't written down how you do things and why you do things and when you do things, then you're just doing them on the fly. And who's to say whether you'll do it the same way next time and whether that will be better or worse than the last way you did it? That's not how you run a good business. So that is, in essence, why we should have policies as teachers. It's so that we provide the same experience to everyone, give or take, right? Things should be repeatable and consistent so that we're fair, really fair, and so that we don't run ourselves ragged and keep going until the well runs completely dry. Because I keep saying that you're a business, but chances are you're a business of one. The business is you. So if you just run around in circles all day and, you know, follow whichever parent is the most demanding or whatever system comes up next, then you're going to run yourself dry. You're going to run out of resources. So put some policies in place if you don't have them already. And if you do, listen to this list in case there's one of these that you could do with some tweaking or that you don't have already. Here's my list of essential policies. Yours may be different or the same. This is something that needs to be unique and individual, but I'll give you a starting point. The basics of studio policies include when you will be paid. So are you going to be paid monthly? semesterly? Do you give parents a choice? If they are paying monthly, do they have to provide payment before the first lesson of the month? Do they have to provide it before the last lesson of the last month? What is the system there? When will you be paid? And the next thing is, how will you be paid? Are you going to accept cash? Will you accept checks? Will you accept PayPal payments? Think about these options carefully and don't provide too many. Too much choice can get in the way here. In my studio, I allow parents to pay by cash or check or bank transfer. But these might not be the best options for you. I know in Australia, checks have been almost completely phased out and it's expensive to lodge a check. So you wouldn't want to provide that option there. Some parents still like to have their checkbook here, so it does make sense for me. I also do allow cash payments because we're still a fairly cash-heavy economy. 
Of course, not completely, and most people have banking, but some people still prefer to pay pay in cash. And I'm happy to accept it because we have, very local to me, very close by, we have automated cash machines where you can just put the money in. It's fairly simple. So because of that, I do accept cash payments, but it might not be right for you. I also accept direct bank transfers. Again, this depends on where you are. But for us, setting up an internet bank transfer is very simple for parents to do with most banking systems. With most banks, the online system is very simple. It's quick, it's easy, it's efficient, and it costs way less than if we used a credit card system or PayPal or anything like that. So that's my online system. That might not be the best fit for you, as I keep saying, so find out what is. But I would heavily advise you against using something that is designed for peer-to-peer payments. Again, think like a business. Businesses would not accept Venmo payments or something like that that are designed and have in their terms of conditions that they're designed just for peer-to-peer, friend-to-friend. If you find something that has no fees, That's usually what it's designed for. Things that are designed for business payments come with a fee. And that fee is usually worth paying. It's about 3% and it's a cost of doing business and it's a fair part of running your business and using their payment provider, their payment system. Anyway, decide what will work for you and make sure it's a professional option. The next part of your policies should include the calendar and the scheduling. So when do you schedule students, as in when do you set up the timetable and how long is that timetable valid for? Do students book their own appointments week by week? That can be an option that works especially for adult student heavy studios. Maybe you need to allow that flexibility. If so, put a cancellation policy in place. If you are scheduling students for the whole year, make sure that is clear. And make sure you have a clear calendar showing when you take studio holidays and when lessons run as normal. The next part of your policies is sort of connected to that and part of it, but it deserves its own separate explanation. And that is about makeup lessons. I've gone into this in a separate episode and we will link to that in the show notes at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 102. But The abbreviated version is please don't do makeup lessons. Please don't allow parents to reschedule whenever they feel like and to insist that you get up on Saturday mornings to teach their child. Please don't do that to yourself. Check out the other episode for more information about makeup lessons and why I don't believe in them. Another section of your policies could cover punctuality. This is related, but I like to make it clear in my policies that. Lessons will start at the agreed upon time, whether the student is there or not, and finish at the agreed upon time, right? So if the student is late to my studio, fine, we'll just start the lesson late, but it's still finishing at the same time. If the student is not there for an at-home lesson, because I have other teachers going to students' homes to teach there, if the student is not there when the teacher arrives, we have in place that they will wait for a certain number of minutes before leaving. This means that our teachers are not sitting outside in the rain wondering where the student is and ringing the doorbell again and again, right? They have to wait for a certain number of minutes and then they leave. So that's especially important for at-home lessons. But if you're teaching at your studio, then just make it clear that lessons will always finish at the agreed upon time, at the scheduled time, no matter what time they start at. The last area I'll put in here is definitely an optional one and it depends on your particular setup, but it can be important for some teachers. And that is parking and performances. So parking is important, especially if you live in a gated community or a particular area where parking is tricky or where there's paid parking, that kind of thing. Make it clear where parents can and cannot park. And If you're going to have performances at certain times of the year, especially if these are going to be required in your studio, then make that clear in your policies as well. Those are just the basics. 
But the most important thing I want to get across to you about your policies is not what should go in them. It's what they are not. The biggest mistake I see teachers making is assuming that the policies are going to do a job that they just will not do. In fact, policies don't do any work for you. Sorry, they just don't. So policies are not a way to get out of having difficult conversations. They are not an effective communication tool and they are not a legally binding contract. A lot of the time I see teachers treating them as if they're going to do these things and they just don't. They're not supposed to and they wouldn't be effective at it even if you tried to make them do that. So they're not a legally binding contract because you're not going to get a lawyer to write them. So they're more of a code of conduct than they are really a contract. They are also not a way to get out of hard conversations or a communication tool. And this is really one to hammer home to you, is you cannot just hand the policies to a new parent in your studio and assume that you have communicated these things to them. Number one, they will not read them. And number two, sorry, but that's a cop-out. You have to have the conversation. I don't enjoy it either. I don't like going through payments. I find it slightly awkward, although it definitely gets easier with time. Talking about money is not super fun. Talking about the things that might go wrong is not the most entertaining conversation to have with a new family in your studio. But if you get used to having this conversation, it can be quick and effective and friendly and it can get your points across and alleviate so many headaches down the track. So policies are your backup, and most importantly, policies are for you. They're not for the parents. You give them to parents so that you have them there to refer to, but they are for you, so that you are consistent. Our word of the day, right? Consistent. Policies are about you laying down on paper what way you operate things, how you run things, so that you can do the same thing again and again and stick to it. And yes, occasionally refer parents back to the policies when they have questions. That's what they're for. I hope you've enjoyed this part of our foundation series, our 101 series. Come back again next week to consider another word. And in the meantime, consider the word consistent and how it applies to your studio, your policies and your procedures. I'll see you back here next week. Early on in this pandemic, I decided to keep the podcast a pandemic panic free zone as teachers look for a bit of respite from what's going on in the world right now. And that's going to continue. But if you do need access to resources, we absolutely have them available for you to help you improve your online teaching game, to get you set up, to help you with whatever you need. So if you're not a member, you can sign up using the coupon code online right now. You can use that for monthly membership and it will get you one week trial to the membership for just one dollar so that you can test it out and get access to the resources that you need. Games for online teaching, creative ideas and tech help as well. If you are a member, all you need to do is jump over to the library or into our community forums and we'll be able to help you there. See you on the inside.